You should have uh, in your bulletin somewhere a little sheet that, uh, shall we say, is fairly fresh out of the press today. <laughs> so if you want to take some notes, what we are doing for this month, thank you to uh, Dori Kutsiad and to Arthur Tupai and our small group committee, we are going to do a book. Uh, I have it here. I didn't hold it up. What's so amazing about grace? Many of you are going to small groups. We're going to do it. My Sabbath or class is going to do it. So we hope that uh, if you don't already have one, you'll go to Amazon and get one. They said today you can buy a combo with the Jesus I never knew and read along with us. We will preach from it here on the Sabbath morning, uh, four sermons. The small groups will study the week after and discuss what we've talked about and the book. And we just would like to become a church that just knows more and lives and lives out grace in every way. Amen? Amen. We hope this will be a blessing to you. So if you want to have that with you, I'll try to refer to it uh, here and there as we, as we go along. The, uh, there's an old joke that goes something like this. And there are different versions of it. An Irishman moved from Ireland to Boston. He's in Boston and every Sunday afternoon he would go to a bar and he would order three beers. Every week, week after week after week. Finally, the bartender said to him, how come every week the three beers? He said, well, you know, I left two brothers back at home. We used to go drinking on Sundays. So I drink one for me, one for each of my brothers. They're over there. They do the same. And so it's like we're still together drinking at the same time. For years, three beers. One Sunday afternoon, he came in and ordered two beers. And the bartender just figured one of the brothers had to die. And so he said, to, I'm so sorry for your loss. I'm sorry. He said, there's no loss. My brothers are fine. He said, then how come the two beers? He said, oh, my wife forgot me to go to church, and I'm getting baptized, and I have to quit drinking. <laughs> Did you get it? Have someone explain it to you, all right? <laughs> and if you can get that little joke, that is essentially what Philip Yancey starts off in this book trying to, trying to say, is that many of us in the church have, have thought at least that we received grace for ourselves and we quit trying to live by works. But somehow with everybody else, we're still trying to live by works. We really haven't quit works for them. Because he says the church should be a place of grace. If we have been saved by grace, then shall the church be filled with grace? Should the church be the one place in the world that you can come from wherever you come from, and you may be out there in the real world, but here it's grace. Everyone, everywhere, every time. He tells a famous story on the first page of the first chapter. It's in another book, too, about a friend of his who had a prostitute in Chicago come to see him. And, and she's just a mess. And she doesn't have any money to take care of her habit. And she, she's being a very bad person. She's even involving the little two-year-old girl that she has in this bad stuff. She can't feed her little girl. And she's a mess. And in trying to help her, you know, he finally says to her, have you thought about going to the church. Maybe the church could help you out a little bit. She said, the church? Why would I want to go to the church? I already feel terrible about myself. They'll just make me feel worse. No, the church is supposed to be a place of grace. Everywhere else you have to be measured and compete and fight and win. And, and if you don't compete well, you'll be out. The church should be the one place you walk in. And it's grace. And he tells many stories of grace and ungrace. He talks about growing up in a very conservative church. It is not ours, all right? It's not us. You may have a parallel to some of this. He grew up at a conservative church in the South, and he said, we had all these rules, no smoking, no drinking. Though a few people worked in the tobacco industry, there was a few there. No movies, no dancing. No rock music. Rock music was from the demons. He said, no reading the newspaper on Sunday, no watching sports, no playing sports on Sunday, no short skirts for the girls, 
No long hair for the guys. That's how I grew up, he said. And he said, the better you did on that list of rules, the closer you were to God. It was like a ladder, and he says, like religions all over the world. That was my church, too. You had this ladder, and you had to try to climb up that list of rules if you wanted to get to God at the top of the rules. He said, I just couldn't do it. He said, I went to a conservative Bible college, and he said, I was considered a deviant at this campus. He said, there would be prayer meetings where people would publicly pray for me, and God, please bless and save Philip Yancey. He said, people would come up to me and wanted to know if I would like to have an exorcism to have the demons cast out. And he said, I found no grace at this Bible college. Now he's famous. They invited him to come back and speak, and he told them that. He said, when I was going here, there should have been a place of grace. I did not find grace until I, after I left this place. He said, I stayed out of church for years. The president of the college got mad. Why did you have to say that? Supposed to be grace. Everyone is looking for grace. Famous story. He tells it in here. Hemingway told. Hemingway himself looking for grace. Had a terrible relationship with his mother. And he tells a story about Paco. Paco was in Spain, lived in Madrid. Had a terrible fight with his father. Got uh, so bad he finally just raced out of the house. And they never saw him again. They looked all over the country trying to find him. Ten years Finally, they didn't know what else to do. They put a note in the newspaper in Madrid. Paco, all is forgiven. Please come home. We'll meet you Sunday at noon behind the train station. They went down on Sunday morning hoping they would find Paco. And 800 Paco showed up. <laughs> Famous story. Everybody's looking for grace. Some place where they will forgive me, where I can be treated not based on who I am and how I perform, just have me home. Yancey wants to say in this book that Jesus really doesn't do theology. That's Romans and Galatians. You cannot find kind of a lecture about grace in Jesus. Hardly even mentions the word. Jesus tells stories. And he does grace. But he doesn't talk much about it. There's no charts. There's no Latin words. And so Yancey tries to do the same in this book. It's filled with stories of both kinds of stories. He tells about 1987 in Ireland when one of the IRA bombs went off and a building was destroyed and a father and his 20-year-old daughter were buried under five feet of rubble. And the father, the father makes it out, but the 20-year-old daughter is gone. And when he comes out, he says, I forgive them, the bombers. He said, my daughter is gone, but I hold no grudge against them, and I will pray every night and every night for the rest of my life that God will forgive them. It's grace. It's hard to find these stories. I struggle to find them. I've been preaching 38, 39 years, trying to find more grace. It's hard to find them. And so you end up going to the movies and to the parables and to the novels, trying to find it where it's made up. That's why we use movie clips once in a while, because it's hard to find real life stories of grace. And you think about it, you know, Pretty Women, Forrest Gump, Les Miserables. These are great stories of grace woven in there. In the book, he tells over several pages that I cannot do all of it, the story of Babette's Feast. Do you know the movie Babette's Feast? is a classic. They call it a cult classic. Many, many years ago, I was a pastor at La Sierra and hadn't been out very long, and someone brought it to me. It was in Danish with English subtitles, the first person I saw. The lady who wrote the book out of Africa tells this story about a small little group of people, this little sect on the coast of Denmark. And it's an old man and his two gorgeous, beautiful daughters. And they have a little church with a few people. And it's a Lutheran sect, very strict, very high standards, only certain kinds of songs, very minimal diet. You cannot eat anything really that tasted good. You cannot, there was no joy in any of these people. A young soldier comes by and falls in love with one of the girls. The girls are just stunning. And uh, there's a little love story, but finally it's clear this is not going to happen, and she sends him away. 
they will live single the rest of their lives. Anyway, the old man finally passes away, and the group struggles to hold on. They try to remember his memory. They still skit together, just a few people, but they're angry, and there's grudges and stuff. Two people, two women haven't talked for 30 years. There's an affair someone had 30 years ago, and that's in the middle. There's just stuff that's no good. When all of a sudden, in a terrible night of a storm, here comes Babette. They don't know who she is. She has a little note. Would you please take Babette Ben? She can cook. She can cook. <laughs> it was the soldier. He had known this girl. She was in trouble. She needed to get away. He said, go here to my friends. And she walks in. She has no money. She has nothing. So they let her cook. For like 15 years, she is their cook. They don't know anything of her history. They know nothing. When all of a sudden, a letter comes. And her friend has been buying her a lottery ticket with the same number every year. And all of a sudden, she has won the lottery. 10,000 francs. Here's the money. She's going to leave. But she says, before I go, I want to do something big. It's the 100th anniversary of the birthday of their father. They're going to have a big, let's have a big dinner. Invite everyone to come. They don't really want to do it, but they say, okay, okay, that's the last thing. She begins to order all these things, food that you have no idea. Incredible French banquet dinner. So here comes turtles, all kinds of wine and food, incredible. Boatloads of food coming. And they invite all the group. They don't want to eat this kind of food. And they're not allowed to enjoy any of it. So they agree. They have a little meeting. They say, we will eat the food, but we will not enjoy it. <laughs> all right? So that's the dinner. So here they sit, this group, with all of their old grudges and all of their stuff. And in walks the general. The soldier is now a general. With all his regalia, and he walks in. And he begins to eat. Oh, he knows this wine. This is, ha, did you get this wine? And he begins to eat the food. And he says, I have had this before. I had this one time in Paris. There can only be one chef in the world who can make this? How can you have it here? They're not enjoying this at all. They're refusing to enjoy a taste of this. But he keeps talking, oh, this is so good. Finally, it begins to break. And they just can't help it. It's just too good. And they begin to smile, and they begin to talk. The two old ladies that have not talked for 30 years begin to talk. The one that had the affair, there's forgiveness and a pop, we're sorry. And they begin to talk. And by the end of the dinner, they're all eating and they're laughing and they're talking. And they go outside at the end of the movie in this circle of people, these people that have just lost their whole grace religion, have now gotten it. And they are singing a song out under the stars. The party is over. And Babette comes in. And the two old sisters say, that was a wonderful dinner, Babette. And she says, that was the dinner I used to cook at the cafe in Paris. It was her. She was the chef. The general was talking about. You're going to go now? Yes. No, I'm not going to go. You're not going to go? I cannot go. I don't have any money. What do you mean? Where's the 10,000 francs? I spent it all on the feast. And it becomes a parable of God and His grace that even though we've been trying to live by legalism, God comes in and He just pours out it all. He pours out everything He has in Jesus Christ and He spreads a feast of grace. And if you'll let Him, He will mold down, melt down the hardness of your heart and He will turn away grudges and He will put people back together again and you can have a life of joy and a feast of grace. God has spent it all to give you grace. Amen? Amen. What's so amazing about grace? So go watch the movie again sometime. Babette's Feast. Well, let's think a little bit about theology just for a moment. Satan hates God. And he has used lies for thousands of years to somehow take away God's grace and his goodness. And Satan is going to find some way to try to cut God's grace down in half. 
And I want to take a couple of minutes here and bring up three questions that are old questions, and then we'll see if we can answer them as we work through the first four chapters of this book. The first question is this, as Satan has tried to split God into two eras of history, it's famous. That God, he, Satan wants to say this about God. That God back there at the tree in the garden said, if you eat of the tree, you shall surely die. They ate of the tree, they should surely die. God does not kill them. But he really has a sense of justice that demands that he kill them. But he stores that little justice away. And for thousands of years, every time someone sinned, God stores away a little more justice and wrath. But finally it comes down to the cross. And now at the cross, God finally sends his own son down and he takes all that stored up wrath and he pours it out on Christ and he takes out that wrath and now his justice is satisfied. And now Jesus can, God can forgive. And so Satan splits God into two eras of history of wrath and justice and now after Easter, grace and mercy. And the other question that God, Satan has done is to split the Godhead between the God the Father who is wrath and judgment and justice and Jesus who is mercy and grace and love. And the third way is that he splits Jesus and God themselves into two. And half of Jesus and God are love and grace and want everyone to live. And the other half is justice and wrath and everyone's going to have to be punished for their sins. One way or the other, God's grace is cut in half. Who is God really? What is he right here today? And if you aren't careful, if you take 1 John chapter 2, verse 1, I don't want you to sin. But if you do, we have an advocate with our Father in heaven. And so we have the idea that even though God has forgiven and accepted the cross, he really is still pretty much that Old Testament God who has wrath and judgment against sin. But when you sin every time, what you have to do is no worries, you can go through Jesus. And if you ask Jesus to do something, he will go into the Father and he will find a way to somehow talk the Father out of his wrath and give us grace, grace and mercy after all. But God really hasn't changed. He's still the same. And you have to have, use Jesus to talk him out of it over and over again every time you sin. Is that what God is really like? What's so amazing about grace? Well, I'm going to take a, just try to try to answer those questions today. Philip Yancey in chapter 4, as a great writer, I cannot take time to do all that he does, takes four of Jesus' parables and begins to try to write them in new and modern ways. So you can go and read the book and read them more fully. I will just give you the quick synopsis of it. The first one is a homeless bum who lives kind of behind some stores in Manhattan, New York. Every day he goes dumpster diving and he goes through the dumpsters behind the restaurant and he tries to collect some fish or some garlic bread someone has left on their plate or a little piece of cake. Whatever he can't eat right now, he puts in a little brown bag. He goes around and tries to find some bottles and trash and he has a little rusty grocery cart that he has all his stuff in and he's walking when all of a sudden he sees a little lottery ticket from last week on the street for years when he had a dollar he would buy one lottery ticket he has no money but once in a while he sees one that someone is throwing down he picks it up and just by chance he sees a newspaper looks it open takes the number seven digits begins to count the first one number two number three four the fourth one the fifth and seven out of seven match. He's won the lottery. And all of a sudden, there were TV lights all around him. And there's a reporter right in front of him. And here he is, this long-haired bum, has won the lottery and will have $243,000 a year for the next 20 years. And he realizes he will never be hungry again. Story number one. The second one is a man who's uh, living in Los Angeles. He keeps reading about all these people who are doing travel, agency programs all over the world, adventure travel and all kinds of cool stuff. And he gets an idea. 
He will organize a travel company that does the adventure, and we will go see the seven ancient wonders of the world, hanging gardens of Babylon and the pyramids and all the others. So he goes to a rich venture capitalist, and he gets a loan for a million dollars. And he gets his commercials together, and he gets them on television, and it looks cool. And they're going to go to ba ha Hanging Gardens in Babylon in, in Iraq. And he gets people to begin to sign up. It'll just take four or five trips of this, of 40, 50 people, and he will begin to pay that loan back, no problem. When all of a sudden, Saddam Hussein invades Kuwait, and there is a war in Iraq, and there is no more travel to Iraq. All the tickets are gone, and the million dollars is gone. What's he going to do? He tries to calculate. How, how kind of payment can I make? He begins to calculate. If I give 5000 a month, how long will it take me to pay that off? The 5000 doesn't even cover the interest, much less any of the principal. What's he going to do? Finally, he has to go down to Beverly Hills and walk up to the office and walk in front of this man and say, I just, I just can't. I'll pay you 5000 a month. That's all I can do. A little payment plan. It's all, I, I don't know what else to tell you. The war started. And the guy says, I am a venture capitalist. This is what I do. I knew there was a chance that this wasn't going to work out. I win some, I lose some. How are you going to know that the war is going to break out? Don't worry about it. And he tears up the contract. He says, don't worry about it. Forget about it. The guy walks out with a million dollars gone. Good. Number three. Young couple's going to get married. Lady, they're in love, magic. They're getting all the plans ready. Some of you know about this. Did several premarital's this week. And they go to Hyatt downtown Boston, 1990, and they're making a deal. And they take all the food and all the flowers, and they get $50,000 for the reception. And they make the payment. Comes the day when the invitations are sent out. And he backs out, just too scared to make a commitment. Anybody know about that? Can't do this. She said, what? She races down to the Hyatt and she says, we're not going to get married after all. Can I get my money back? We're not going to have a wedding. Stop. I said, no, okay. we signed a contract. Our policy says we give you back 10%. That's it. 45000 gone. She gets an idea. The money's gone anyway. She says, I used to be in a homeless shelter 10 years ago. Let's have the wedding anyway. Who cares about that bum? <laughs> so she announces they're going to have a wedding reception anyway. She sends the invitation to all the missions and the homeless shelters. Here they come into this Hyatt Regency gorgeous ballroom. And they have chicken. The main dish was boneless chicken in honor of the groom who didn't have any. <laughs> And here they are, bag ladies, guys in their grocery carts, winos and drunkards and all kinds of people, old people with their walkers and canes, and just here they all are with a banquet of their dreams, with the most incredible food and desserts and food and a live band and dancing, and they have the night of their lives till after midnight. Good. Number four, you'll all recognize I've used this all over the world in every Bible study, every sermon on the prodigal son. It tells a story of a girl who was fighting with her father. Every day they didn't like her clothes, they didn't like her hair, they didn't like her music, they didn't like her friends, nothing. Her skirts, yelling and screaming, he finally yells at her enough and she finally says, I hate you, races out of the house, has a little bit of money, jumps on a bus from Upper Peninsula in Michigan down to Detroit. She figures they'll never find me in Detroit. They'll figure I'll be in California somewhere, not Detroit. She's walking down the side of the road when all of a sudden a big black car pulls up and says, hey, you kid, you hungry? Yeah, I'm hungry. Takes her to a gorgeous meal, takes her to a hotel, puts her in a luxury suite, gives her some pills that make her feel like nothing she's ever felt before. And pretty soon she is a teenage prostitute. She's having a lot of fun. She's making a lot of money. Everybody wants her. She's having fun. She's drinking and partying, and it's, it's a great time. After a year, though, she begins to show signs of being sick. She's 17 years old. She begins to not be so good. 
Now nobody wants her anymore. He kicks her out of the hotel. There's no more money. There's no more food. There's no more party. There's no more pills. Now she's walking down the street. It's cold now in Detroit. She tries to find a little grate out in front of a store somewhere that has a little heat coming. She tries to sleep there, wraps up with newspapers. How did I end up here? After a few weeks and nights of that, she's hungry and it's cold. She said, maybe this is not so good. And she calls back home, hears her father's voice on the machine. She hangs up, scared what to say. Finally, the third time, she leaves a message and says, I'm going to come home on the bus. If you're going to let me come home and you're there, then I'll come home. If you're not there, I'll just keep on riding to Canada. Never mind. She gets on the bus. Seven hours from Detroit up to Upper Peninsula, driving. She gets a little speech together. Dad, I'm so sorry. I was stupid. I'll try to do better. Just let me come home. Finally, 11 o'clock, she begins to get her act together, trying to get her little mirror, trying to get herself spruced up. The bus rolls at midnight into the terminal. The bus driver says, you got 15 minutes, then we leave. Everyone else gets off. She finally has got to get off. And she walks off the bottom step, and here they all are. There's 42, some people, he says. Here was the parents and the grandparents and the aunts and the cousins, and everybody all wearing little funny hats and a big banner, welcome home. She comes in front of her dad, and she starts the little speech. Dad, I'm so sorry. I was, I was wrong. Just, I'll do better. Let me come home. No, 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 honey, never mind. We're just glad you're home. That's the story. Amen? Amen. Four stories. You can go read them fuller yourself. Here is the question. If I could have a cross standing right here. Did Jesus, when he was trying to tell stories about what his father was like, did he tell those stories before the cross or after the cross? When did he tell the stories? Before the cross. Jesus, when he had three years to come down and tell the world what his father was like, he used stories to do it. And he told the stories before the cross, before he died, before he paid any blood. Which means that the idea that somehow God is this kind of God before the cross and he changes to become another kind of God is just not right. Because Jesus told the stories of what God is really like before the cross. God is not someone who has been storing up his wrath for thousands of years. He is not a God of anger and wrath and pouring out his own wrath on his son. Jesus says, my father is like this. And he tells stories of grace. Was he telling the truth? I'd like to have you turn in one passage quickly to the book of Romans. Turn to the book of Romans. I don't know if I've messed my PowerPoint up too much. Can you guys move around and come to Romans? Very good. I moved a couple things around. And I give credit to Dr. Ivan Blazin, been a professor of mine for many years, wrote a paper here a while ago about this. Please understand that I believe in the Bible, and I believe in the Bible versions, and they are the Word of God. But there are human people translating, and once in a while, there's a little subtle nuance of people's belief that can fit in. And he is suggesting that in this particular case, in the New International, it shows up. So we'll see what you think. In the book of Romans, there's a word that we translate righteousness or justification. It's all the same word, translated different meanings depending on the context. And I will ask you, based upon the outline that you have in your sheet, if you think it is good news or bad news, Revelation, um, Romans 1, verse 17. For in the gospel, a righteousness from God is revealed. A righteousness that is by faith. The righteous will live by faith. Is the word righteousness there good or bad? Good news or bad news? It's the gospel. Gospel means good news. Has to be good news. Now turn to Romans chapter 3, verse 21. But now a righteousness from God apart from law has been made known. Good news or bad news? Good news. 
We're all guilty, but now a righteousness has come apart from works of law. Good news. Verse 22. This righteousness from God comes through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. There is no difference. Good news or bad news? Good news. Number three. Number four. Verse 24. And are justified. Same Greek word. And are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. Good news or bad? Good news. Four in a row. Good news. Now watch verse 25. God presented him as a sacrifice of atonement through faith in his blood. He did this to demonstrate his justice. Same Greek word. It's not righteousness now. It's not justification. Justice. Because in his forbearance, he had left the sins committed beforehand unpunished. Why in the world, in the same passage, in the same Greek word, four times in a row, it is good news, all of a sudden, the translators slip in justice and say that this is justice, that God has been holding back his justice, and now finally, after thousands of years, he let it go for a while in his forbearance. But now... In Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ is the sacrifice, and now that punishment has come, and justice is now satisfied. Why does the translator switch words? After four good news words, does he switch the fifth time? And number six is in verse 26. He did it to demonstrate his justice at the present time. I would like to say to you, it is because the translator's have grown up in a tradition that is a thousand years old that says from one Catholic priest a thousand years ago that God is a kind of God who gets mad when people sin and he's been storing up his wrath and his anger about it for thousands of years and he finally has his justice satisfied by pouring it out on his son Jesus Christ. And they put it in this version and I want to say, no, God is good news from the beginning, the same today, yesterday, today, and forever. Grace is not something God all of a sudden learns after thousands of years. He has not been holding back his wrath all this time. God is not a wrath and punishing God. God is a God of grace. Jesus came to tell us what God is like. He is like the Father waiting for people to come home. The door was always open. He is the Father who gives you the lottery ticket. He is the one who makes a feast of a banquet. That is who God is before the cross. He is not one kind of God for thousands of years, and now you have to go through Jesus to talk him out of having his wrath and mercy on you again. That is not what God is like. God is a forgiver. Now let's go to the passage for today in the last five minutes very quickly. It is in Luke chapter 23. And i got to go through this, just look at his split here. Luke 23 is a passage about the story of the thief on the cross. If you want to turn to it, you can turn to it quickly. Luke 23, we can look at those two verses. You know the story. Jesus is hanging up there between two thieves. One of them says, hey, if you're really so special, save yourself and save us while you're at it. And the other thief comes along and says, no, come on. Are you sure that's the way you want to be talking to him? And the other thief says, don't you fear God since you're under the same sentence? Verse 41, we are punished justly, for we are getting what our deeds deserve, but this man has done nothing wrong. And we have our little sheet. If you had only this one passage in the whole Bible, you could learn an awful lot about the character of God. Watch as we go through this very quickly. Number one, one sees that he is Jesus, one sees him as a criminal. They look alike. There's three guys hanging up on cross. They look exactly like there was nothing that makes Jesus stand out as somehow God. But somehow one of them says, I think this one is different. And he stakes his whole life on this one. So number one, it's always by faith. You have to just see it. You have to just see the difference between the thief and the king who has a kingdom. It's by faith. Number two, he is a thief. Jesus tells a thief he's going to be with him in heaven. And he dies that day or very soon after. 
He never had a chance to read the Bible, never had a chance to go to church, never had a chance to pay any tithe, never had a chance to keep the true Sabbath, never had a chance to change his life, never had a chance to go back and pay back the people that he has taken the money. He is a thief. And Jesus says, you're going to be with me in the kingdom someday. By works. Because he never gets a chance to do any good works. Number three. You're writing it down? No guilt, no grace. This man says, we are getting what we deserve. If you do not admit that you're a sinner deserving to die, then there's no grace. Grace is only grace if you admit that you don't deserve it. Amen? If you still think you're kind of doing okay and pretty good and you're all right, then there's no grace. It's not grace anymore. Number four, grace is all there is. There is no one else. There's three. You can either go with the thief or you can go with the Jesus in the middle. That's all there is. There's no other option. There's only grace. If you don't go for grace, there's nothing else. There's no backup plan. There's only grace. And finally, number five, grace is always enough. Amen? Amen. <laughs> What does Jesus say to him now? I assure you today. I assure you today. You will be with me in paradise. Would that feel good to hear that? Do you need to hear it today? <laughs> I assure you today. There's no doubt. You will be with me in paradise. You will. Now let me go a little further. Let me not uh, blow any of your Adventist minds. We make a big deal about the comma in the Adventist church about this verse because people try to use this verse to say, I assure you, today you will be with me in paradise. We do not believe anyone physically goes to heaven as soon as they die. It's not in the Bible. But I want to say to you spiritually, it is absolutely true is that the moment you say to Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom, the moment you say that, Jesus says to you, today you'll be with me in paradise. We go from death to being saved the moment you give your life to Christ. Today. Jesus said, Scripture has been fulfilled today. Zacchaeus, he said, today salvation has come to your house. The Bible is filled the moment you give your life to Christ. Today it is as if you are sitting at the right hand of God and it's already you're on the sea of glass shouting victory over the lamb, victory over the beast and in the lamb. That's what the Bible says. It is absolutely true. Do you need to hear it today? Today you will be with me in paradise. How do I get into paradise? What does Jesus say? You will be with me. There's only one way to go to paradise with me. Now here's the question to wrap this up. When does Jesus give this man grace? Before the cross or after the cross? Which is it? Has Jesus died yet? Has he poured out his blood yet? Not yet. This is the next to last thing he says. The next thing is, Father, into your hands commit my spirit. He has not died yet, and yet Jesus is giving forgiveness to a thief. And Jesus says, I only say what my Father says me to say. When Jesus says something, who is really saying it? It is the Father. The Father is forgiving a thief before Jesus dies on the cross. The idea that God is somehow reluctant to forgive until his wrath is satisfied on the cross, and now he becomes a forgiver, is just wrong. Jesus says, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they are doing. God is a forgiver. Grace is not something God learns, not something God solely figures out. He doesn't have to have anyone die for him to become a forgiver. It is there. God is a forgiver. Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever. We start this series on grace with this. Now we've got to finish up quickly. Steps to Christ has a quote. It's in there. You can read it. Jesus is almost dead. He is minutes away from dying. He's been up all night. He's been beaten. He's got thorns. He's got nails in his hand. He's all that his friends have run away. And he's about dead. And Jesus still is gracious. Amen? Sometimes we have a hard time being gracious. Say, well, I was tired. I was under stress. I had a lot going on. 
someday we were going to have a church of families of a group of people who are gracious, everyone, everywhere, every time. Doesn't matter if you're tired. Doesn't matter if you've been up all night. Doesn't matter if someone's hurting you. We are still, wouldn't that be great? Just gracious all the time. Now here comes the final question. How did this man know that this was Jesus and that somehow this one was a king and had a kingdom? How did he know? Just three guys hanging on crosses. How in the world did he know that this one had a kingdom? Nothing you could see. It's just something he could smell. Somehow he took a chance that this one gives grace to thieves. Is that good? It's just something you can smell. Someday, that's the way it's going to be at the end of the world. People are just going to smell grace. That's what Philip Yancey is crying for in this book. What's so amazing about grace? For churches to be a place that just smell. We are not like the rest of the world. We do not just measure and compare and judge and criticize and argue. We are different. And the smell just goes out and people will come up to us and say, could you just remember me? when you go to your kingdom, and we will be the ones, one by one, to say for Jesus, today you'll be with us in paradise. We now become the ones, if they could just smell it. That deal about the Pope, it didn't happen. He is not reading Ellen White, and he is not now making Ellen White a saint. But we do believe at the end of the world there will be a movement and there will be some exciting things happen around the world and there will be some big people who will decide that they will decide to join with the truth of God. Will it be because we preach the Sabbath better than we do now? Maybe so. Will it be because we preach diet and living healthfully better? Yes, 800 people at Loma Linda a couple weeks ago. But I will say to you, it will not be primarily because of the Sabbath or how to live. It will be because... We as a church just smell like grace. And people will just say, I need a church filled with grace. It is our dream. It's our biggest dream. We want to grow. We want to be a great church. But first of all, we want to be a church filled with grace. Amen? Last line. I was in my whole hospital there in Bangladesh. I was so sick. I vowed as I walked in there, I was going to love those nurses I was going to tell those nurses how wonderful they were, how beautiful they were, how good they were, whatever it took. Those nurses were going to have more love for me than they've ever had from any patient in the history because I wanted them to treat me good and get me well. I was nice to those nurses. I wanted to represent Jesus, yes, but I also wanted to get good care. I began to walk around that hospital, and one guy at the door said to me, you are everybody's favorite patient in this hospital. <laughs> How did he know? I had never seen him before. Because somebody told him, there's a white man here in the hospital who was loving us all, and he is our favorite patient. Do you get it? Someday, may the Garden Grove Church be known for that. And the smell of grace just goes out from this church. And the thieves around us will say, remember us when you guys go into your kingdom. Amen? Amen. That's the gospel of grace.